Hello and welcome back to Neural Data Science. Today we're going to go over the steps involved in setting your computer up for data science and setting up the accounts you'll need to use the tools and then install the software tools themselves. So the tools we use and install today include GitHub, which is a cloud service for developing code, sharing code, working collaboratively, storing your code, and that sort of thing as well as it provides a number of other services, including GitHub Copilot, the icon below there, uh, which is an AI coding assistant. We're also going to install Anaconda Python. Your computer may already have Python installed, but you want to install Anaconda to make sure things are all set up and working right for this course. Uh, Anaconda also provides something called Jupyter Notebooks, which we'll use extensively in this course. There's no explicit step today that uh, will install Jupyter Notebooks, but that functionality will get added in. Uh, as well, we're going to install VS Code, which is an integrated development environment, or in other words, a software package that allows you to write code, to run code, edit code, uh, synchronize your code with GitHub, and install a number of extensions that add functionality, including GitHub Copilot, the AI Assistant, Data Wrangler, which allows you to work with data, and a number of other tools as well. All right, so let's get started. We're going to start with GitHub. So GitHub is a cloud-based platform for developing and sharing code. It's a powerful system for developing software collaboratively, and it's used by millions of software developers around the world. GitHub was originally uh, founded by three developers and then sold to Microsoft for billions of dollars. So that gives you a sense of the sheer value of this platform to the software development world. Uh, GitHub is organized largely into what we call repositories, which you can think of as projects or spaces. So a repository is got a, it has a title and it contains files that are specific to a particular project. Repositories can be public, uh, in which case anybody can see them and access and download the materials, or they can be private, in which case you have to have permission in order to access them. But even with public repositories, the fact that you can view the code and download the code doesn't mean that you can actually make changes to the code in the repository. So the owners of the repository can control uh, who can modify the code and accept changes to it and that sort of thing. All changes to a repository are tracked. Uh, and this is really important. So every time you make a change, uh, so if you are working on a repository, you do a step called cloning that will copy the files from the GitHub repository onto your own computer. At that point, you can edit them, test them, run them, make changes, save the files as you go. None of that changes what's on GitHub. Every change that you make and you save, you have to explicitly commit, which means that you're saying, yes, I want this change to be part of the GitHub repository. That's an explicit step, and every time you make a commit, you write a short little message that describes what the change is, maybe why. And as you're working, you make lots of commits, and this is a habit, we're going to talk a bit more about this, a habit that you get into of make a change, save a change, commit it. You don't necessarily want to commit every change, you want to make sure that the changes actually work, maybe, before you commit them, um, but you will be doing this quite frequently. And then uh, after that, you would push them to the GitHub Cloud Platform. We'll cover this in, in detail later on. Uh, another thing is that GitHub has mechanisms to propose and discuss changes to the code and track what changes are made, and also to prevent changes from breaking existing code. So when you have a software project where multiple people are contributing, different people might suggest uh, how to fix a bug, or they might find a bug and just report it. They might uh, have ideas for changes that they want to make, and GitHub allows you to have essentially like a message board specific to each idea or topic where these discussions can happen and link those to the code itself. And also, as you make changes and push them into the repository, there's ways to check that they're not going to break the functionality of the, the software that's already there. I'm going to take a minute to go into some of the core concepts of GitHub, even though today we're mostly going to focus on just getting the, the software installed. Uh, but this is really vital because we're going to be working with GitHub a lot in this course. So again, a repository is a collection of files specific to a project. Uh, there's local and remote versions of a repository. So the remote version is the one that lives on GitHub in the cloud. And then the local version is the one that you clone to your local computer to make changes. And so although there's sort of one 
canonical remote repository, which is on GitHub. Multiple people could be contributing to a project and they might each have their own local version of it. And GitHub has ways when you start to make commits and push your changes back to the remote location, it'll check the changes you've made against any other changes that somebody else might have made and identify if there's conflict. So you've both tried to change the same thing in different ways uh, and allow you to sort out um, where those conflicts are coming from and what version you actually want committed on the main. Committing again is the process of actually saying, yes, the changes I made, I want to commit to the repository and I'm going to document what changes I made. And then finally, once you've made commits on your local copy on your computer, you're going to push those committed changes uh, to GitHub to the remote. Another concept that we'll work with a bit later on is branches. So typically a repository has a, a main branch, so a single branch that has all the files in it. But you can create a, additional branches, which are essentially copies of the repository. And the idea is that if you want to try out a change that might break things or might be significant in some way to the core repository, you don't want to be pushing changes all the time to the main repository and have that break things for other people. You want to create a copy of the repository that you would call a branch that's specific to a particular task. So say you've identified a particular bug in the software that you want to solve. You're going to create a branch to fix that bug. You're going to work on that. And then when you're all done and that bug is fixed, then you can merge that branch back into the main branch. Uh, but in the meantime, different people can work on different features or fixes without uh, interacting and sort of messing up uh, the work that somebody else is doing. So the core workflow that you have to get your head around and get used to doing, uh, even as you're working on assignments uh, for this course, is first you clone a repository from GitHub to your local computer. So you create a local version of the repository. You edit files, you save them, but always remember saving them doesn't commit them to the repository. Saving them only saves copies on your local computer. Commit is an explicit step. We'll talk about how you do that. Uh, each commit requires a message describing the change. These should be uh, pretty succinct. I think you only have 50 characters. Uh, and you should make your commits pretty frequently because you only have a short number of characters to describe the change. And ideally, each specific change is documented on its own commit. And this is important because GitHub tracks the whole history of commits to the repository. And so if you did make a mistake and you want to go back, it's much easier to sort out where the mistake came from if each commit reflects a relatively small change to the overall project. Once you've made the commit, then you have to manually push your changes to GitHub. They don't get automatically synchronized. Um, but once you've done that, you repeat. So you don't have to clone every time. Once you've cloned once, you have that repository on your computer. But you repeat the cycle of edit file, save file, commit, push. Edit, save, commit, push. You're going to get you very used to doing that. And that's kind of the number one thing that trips people up when they first start working on GitHub is they forget to commit or they forget to push. And if you've made a lot of changes without committing them, it can be quite a mess to try and sort out and document what changed. Um, now, fortunately, there are ways to commit individual files. So you might have saved changes to a number of files, but you can commit each file separately, and that might help sorting out what you did. In addition to that core functionality of posting code and allowing people to edit code, track their changes, and collaborate, GitHub offers a number of other tools as well. So among these is GitHub Copilot, the AI coding assistant, GitHub Code Spaces that actually allow you to run code in the cloud. So you can create a code space from any repository, and that opens up your files in an environment where you can actually run code and test it uh, without copying it to your local computer. We're not going to touch on that too much, but just know it's, it's an option for you. They have GitHub Pages, which is a service for free website hosting. And a lot of the course materials for this course are hosted via GitHub Pages. And there's GitHub Classroom, which if you're enrolled in this course uh, formally in a university class, uh, that's how we use uh, GitHub to share exercises and assignments with you and then collect your assignments for grading later on. So the first step in our GitHub adventure is to create an account on github.com. So the first step in your GitHub journey is to create an account on github.com. So go to github.com and you'll see a screen somewhat like this and it starts with your email. 
Now, if you're setting this up as part of a university course or otherwise, if you have an academic affiliation, that is your university student, a high school student, or a university professor, postdoc, something like that, be sure to use the email that's associated with your academic uh, institution. And that's because GitHub offers a free upgrade to a pro account for validated students and faculty and other academic uh, people. And that gives you access to a lot of valuable tools that otherwise you'd have to pay for, including some of the tools that are central to actually uh, doing this course, like the GitHub Copilot AI Assistant. So go ahead and do that. So here we are on github.com and up at the top right, there is a sign in or sign up button. Assuming you haven't already created an account, hit sign up. And put this flashing cursor and it's gonna ask me for my email address. So I am going to use a academic email address that I have for my lab. I haven't set up a GitHub account for it before. And I'm going to use a super secure password. I'm not going to tell you what it is, though. And then we get a fun little puzzle to verify that we're an actual human. So we have to orient that the right way, submit verified so I quit create account and I am going to switch to my email so that I can get that validation code uh, doesn't so much matter what you say here but you should say if it says student or teacher if you're a student say student if you're a teacher or professor say teacher or professor I'm going to pretend I'm a student just because most of you watching this will be students. This doesn't really matter because as a student, you're going to sign up for a student account. Um, so what they're going to suggest for you is a pro account. That's what you want. And you can click here to apply for your GitHub student benefits. I'm going to have to click through a few buttons here. So you want to sign up for the student developer pack, which is the student benefits. And you're going to say, I'm an individual student, so get student benefits. So it shows uh, what email address do you use for school. This is why we want to see it recognizes that I'm affiliated with Dalhousie University, fills that in. Uh, I want to learn data science. That's why I'm going to use GitHub. I'm going to let them know my location. All right, so I ran into a bit of a glitch setting up my account as a student account. And so what I'm going to try, and if you run into glitches, this is a way to get there, is go to uh, or search for GitHub Student Developer Pack. This is a bit of a, a tricky thing because once you're logged into GitHub, if you look at upgrading your account to a pro account, the only option it gives you is to pay for it. But again, if you're a student or a teacher, professor, uh, this is a free upgrade if you do it right. So you, if you go to GitHub Education, then you can sign up for a student developer pack. Click on Get Student Benefits. And it recognizes that I have a Dalhousie University affiliated account. I'm going to say that the purpose of using GitHub is to learn data science. I'm not sure how much that really matters, but they do require you to say something. Click continue, and it asks to see your current location. You have to allow this, otherwise it won't let you get any further. And I'm getting this pop up. So yes, GitHub can see where I am. So there seems to be a bug with GitHub student sign-on that I click continue, and it asked for my location. I said, fine, you can see that my location. And then it just sticks here and it doesn't seem to do anything. And if I hit reload, it's just gonna put me in the same loop. But over here, you can see, and yours may be a different logo. It almost certainly will be because you're probably not using my lab's logo. It shows that I'm signed in as Nickel Data Science, which is the account I created for this purpose. And you can see your benefits. 
So right now that wants to put me back there. I can say re-verify your academic affiliation. After it kind of got stuck there, I reloaded the page, re-entered why I wanted to use GitHub, clicked OK again, and this time it took me further. Not the smoothest process, but we're here. And hopefully you can problem solve anything that you encounter through a similar kind of process. Now you can see that they're asking me to upload proof of my academic status. Now, since I'm not actually a student, and I already have a verified GitHub account as a professor, I'm not going to go through this step. But they do make it quite easy, which is that they're saying you can uh, send a picture of your student ID, make sure it includes a date that verifies your current enrollment, or some other official document from your school that shows that you are uh, a valid student as of this date. And they make it easy in that you can take a picture with your computer's camera of your card or whatever document, or you can upload an image. Note that the images have to be JPEG. If you're working on a Mac and you do like screenshots or things like that, uh, they tend to save as PNGs, not JPEGs, so you might have to convert the image. Um, but if you need to know how to do that, uh, you can search for it on the web. So anyway, you would uh, provide GitHub with proof that you're a student, add that picture here, hit process my application, and you should get a notification right away saying that it's in process. That can take a few days. Uh, last time, I think it was about four days was what they were estimating. So you do want to get that done as soon as possible. You can continue to use GitHub in the meantime, but you won't have access to all the free services that you would get as a student, like the Copilot AI Assistant. So when you log on to github.com, this is the page you'll typically see when you first log in. It's your dashboard. It'll start looking different as you use GitHub more because more things will appear and it sort of suggests things based on your activity. But for now, what we wanna do is set up a few details in your GitHub profile. So top right-hand corner is a little icon that if you click on it, you'll see a number of options uh, about your account. What you wanna to go to is your profile. And here, um, now somehow my email address was already associated with an avatar, maybe from gravatar.com. If not, it's nice to personalize your account and not just use the generic icon, especially if you're in a class. Uh, headshot, cartoony headshot, something that is uniquely you is a good idea. So you can click on that image just to change your avatar to whatever you want. The other thing is to edit your profile, you're going to click edit profile. And if you're taking this as a class or even not, it's generally a good idea to use your real name, especially if you're a scientist, you wanna be open and transparent uh, about your work. And so I'm gonna add my real name there. You can add a short bio, so I'm Professor Dalhousie University in Psychology and Neuroscience. Pronouns, if you want to specify your pronouns. Company, add your university. Location, it's nice to be transparent there. And I like to click display current local time and then tell it what time zone I'm in um, because GitHub does track your activity and changes to your repositories. And when you're looking at those on GitHub, it's nice to actually have the correct dates. If you have a personal website, social accounts, you can link those there. That's not totally vital. Um, saying you don't have any public repositories yet, that's fine. This window here tracks your contributions. So as you start actually pushing changes to GitHub, it'll show your activity here. And that's just kind of a nice way of seeing for an individual developer, how active are they? Are they active certain days of the week, certain times of the year, that kind of thing. But for now, that's all you need to do in terms of your GitHub account. So the next step is to set up GitHub Copilot and Copilot Labs. As I mentioned, Copilot, if you're an academic student, uh, you'll get that for free when you get the free upgrade to the Pro account. So for now, there's nothing you really need to do. If you're not able to access Copilot for free, then you will have to go to uh, search the web for GitHub Copilot or upgrade your account on GitHub and figure out how to set that up or work without AI. 
Copilot Labs, though, is a feature that you have to sign up for and get on a wait list. And typically, my experience, it takes maybe a week uh, to get off the wait list and have Copilot Labs activated. This is something that you'll see within VS Code that extends the functionality of Copilot and gives you some really nice tools. So it's a good idea to do it now so that by the time you need it, you actually have access to it. And I'm just going to do a web search for GitHub Copilot Labs. Here we go. GitHub Next Copilot Labs. And there's just a sign up for Copilot Labs button there. It is going to recognize that I'm uh, already logged in with my GitHub account. So I'm good to go. I say authorize next waitlist. And I have to accept license terms. You can read them if you want to. Hit sign up. And it tells me I'm signed up. And basically, you'll get an email uh, when you have been approved for Copilot Labs. OK, so we have set up our GitHub account and some basic setup on our profile. We've gone on the wait list for Copilot Labs and uh, done the work to get our account set up as an academic account, so the free upgrade. The next thing we want to do is install Python on our computer. You may already have Python on your computer. A lot of computers come with it installed by default, or you may have done something before that installed Python. Regardless, you want to do what we're covering here today, which is installing Python through a software platform called Anaconda. Anaconda is a lot of things, but at its core, what we're going to install is what's called a package manager. So Python is a programming language, and it comes with a lot of functionality built in. But then lots of other people have written Python packages, they're sometimes called libraries, that extend the functionality of Python. And sometimes these packages don't play nicely with each other, especially a lot of them are in active development. Changes get made that break how they interact with some other package. So Anaconda helps ensure that all of the packages that you have installed along with your Python all play nicely together and you have a good working environment for data science. And it's going to install all those for you automatically, pretty much. Later on in the course, there's a couple of packages we'll have to explicitly tell Anaconda to install. But for today, we're just going to go and install Anaconda. So to install Anaconda, let's do a web search for Anaconda and Python distribution. I'm going to hit the download button, which takes me to anaconda.com. You can also just go straight to anaconda.com. And it'll give you a download button and that it should auto detect what platform you're on and offer you the correct version for your platform. For Mac, there's two different kinds of processors your Mac might have. Uh, older Macs would be Intel, the newer Macs would probably be M1 or M2. So uh, that's what I have. So I'm gonna say download for Mac M1, M2. And you'll see up here, the download starts. It's a pretty sizable download, so that could take some time. And uh, we're going to pause and tune back in when that download is done. Once your download is done, you can open the installer, whether you're on Mac or Windows, um, there's an installer application. Just click through that. When you run the installer, you will just uh, accept all of the defaults, don't change anything, just click through and let it do its work. After it installs, it'll launch. So when you first launch Anaconda, you'll see it's also formerly known as Anaconda Navigator. That's the application. It asks you to log in. You don't actually need to create an Anaconda Cloud account. Uh, they'll try and sell you a subscription. For our purposes for this course, you do not need to do that. So I'm just going to X out of that login. And mostly for the course, you're not even going to need to use the Anaconda Navigator. Under the hood, it's installed Python for us, and the software we are going to use, VS Code, will see the Python distribution that Anaconda installed, and you'll be able to use it. But just since we're here, Anaconda Navigator provides you with access to a number of different tools, uh, including you could launch VS Code through this. VS Code will only show up here after you've installed it. So if you're following along, you haven't installed it yet, you won't see it. 
You're welcome to check out these tools, but for this course, you won't really need to use them. I am going to point out, though, that if you click over on the left on environment, this shows you all of the packages that Anaconda has installed for you alongside Python. There's a lot here, and you don't really need to worry about all the details, but it's nice to know that this is where you can go and look and see what packages are installed. If you ever wanted to update Python, which it doesn't hurt to do periodically, you can do that from the navigator. And again, it takes care of making sure that all of your packages are up to date and uh, compatible with each other. Uh, another thing is that you can create multiple environments in Anaconda. And for this course, again, we won't really have to worry about that, but different environments allow you to install different versions of Python or different sets of packages. And that can be useful if you're working on different uh, projects and they require different software packages. But for the moment, now that you know what Anaconda Navigator looks like and that you can go in and upgrade uh, your Python distribution later if you want to, we're gonna close out of Anaconda Navigator. I'm gonna quit it. Next step is to install Visual Studio Code. So in this course, we're going to be using Visual Studio Code for all of our development. So writing code, pulling uh, files from GitHub, pushing files back to GitHub, using the Copilot AI Assistant. So this is kind of our, our home base platform for, for working on the course. Visual Studio Code is an application that was developed by Microsoft. It's free to download and to use, so there's no cost associated with it. I will mention they have another product called Visual Studio without the word code at the end, which has a similar looking icon, but it's kind of a purple color. Everything in this course is based around Visual Studio code. And I'm not gonna worry about the differences, but suffice to say, if you don't have Visual Studio code, go and download that. Don't try and work from Visual Studio because things just won't work the same way or look the same. Okay. So to download Visual Studio Code, we just have to do a web search for, you can actually just type VS Code because that's its abbreviation. And I go to code.visualstudio.com slash download. I'll see options for all of the different platforms. And if you're on Windows, you can safely just click the core Windows button there. Same with the Mac that and it'll show you that it's downloading. It's a relatively fast download. One thing to be aware of is that if you're working on a Windows computer, VS Code, when you do this download, it'll give you an installer. So you'll run that installer and it'll take you through the steps of installing VS Code. A little bit counterintuitively on a Mac, when it downloads VS Code, it just downloads the application itself. It's not an installer. Okay, so I'm working on a Mac. VS Code has finished downloading. So now if I go down to my dock and look in my downloads, I'll see VS Code Darwin Universal. You'll see something like that. It might have a separate, a slightly different name. It might have already unzipped. Mine did not. So if you see a zip, you just double click to unzip it. And what's a bit weird is that what I have here is the actual Visual Studio Code application, not an installer for the application. So if I double click on this, I would actually launch the Visual Studio Code. The problem with that is you don't really want applications living in your downloads folder. You want them in your applications folder. So all you have to do is click on Visual Studio Code and drag it over to applications. And now it's gonna tell me I have an older item because this is my personal computer and I already have it installed. Um, we can replace it because this is probably a newer version anyway. So it goes in my applications folder. If I click on applications, scroll down, I have Visual Studio Code. Now I'm gonna double click to launch it. it. Just warns me. And so VS Code is a Microsoft product and GitHub is owned by Microsoft. And so they work quite nicely together. First step is to choose your color theme, and they have four different options for you there, or you can browse color themes and see more options. Um, it's entirely personal taste. You can see that under where it says browse color themes, there's a number of checkboxes there. 
And so if you click on the sync to and from other devices, click on enable settings sync and it'll have you um, yeah, uh, go up to the top there, sign in and turn on. And you have two options there, sign in with GitHub or sign in with Microsoft. So you wanna sign in with GitHub and you'll use the um, GitHub account that you've already created. And again, because you're already logged in in your browser, it recognizes that and takes you through that step of clicking. Um, yeah, you can say open in all these cases. So basically you're just logging into your GitHub account within VS Code. And uh, they, you know, the thing that it's showing you there is set in sync, which basically means that any settings like your color themes and so on that you do on this computer, if you were to log into VS Code uh, with your GitHub account on another computer, you could synchronize those. Um, that is, you know, maybe not something you need to worry about, but now you're logged into GitHub and certain other functions uh, will work uh, nicely as well. So you don't necessarily have to worry about those other checkboxes at the moment, but there is another step that you need to do now, which is to install some additional extensions. So extensions are different little tools or plugins that extend the functionality of VS Code. And to get to your extensions, maybe I'll give you a brief tour of the interface, first of all. So you can see you've got a window here. It's black. It's the VS Code window. At the top of it, you have your typical menu, like file edit selection and so on. And then on the left-hand side, there's a vertical bar, which is called the activity bar. And that has a lot of useful functions and you can be using the activity bar quite a lot in this course and when you're using VS Code. Yeah, so if you click on the bottom one with the kind of, there's like three squares and then one extra square and you can see when you mouse over it, it says extensions. So this is where you can find and install extensions. And it's gonna suggest some uh, sort of popular extensions. And in fact, that's handy because you want some of the most popular extensions. So the first one it shows there is Python. So you can hit the install button inside Python and it will go and start installing. And the one under it is Jupyter and you wanna install that as well. So click on the install there. And then you'll see there's one under there called Pylance and it already says installing because that gets installed automatically when you install the Python extension. The other ones we're gonna do a search for. So at the top of that list of extensions, it says search extensions in marketplace. If you click in there and type data wrangler, Click install and then go back to that search box and type GitHub. And you'll see there's quite a lot of GitHub extensions. So we'll see if the ones we want pop up. So GitHub Copilot is the first one. You do want to install that because that's our AI coding assistant. And then down at the bottom, you can see another one that says GitHub Copil, uh, and it says AI chat features. So that's GitHub Copilot chat. You can see when you mouse over it, that pops up. So install that one as well. And the one right above it is GitHub Copilot Labs, and you want to install that one as well. And that, remember we signed up for GitHub Copilot Labs, so that feature will get enabled once you're approved. Now over on the right, you can see a couple of pop-ups uh, and they're asking you to sign into GitHub. So even though you signed into GitHub once already, you need to sign in again uh, in order for all of the features to work. Now that pop-up disappeared while I was talking, but that's okay. If you look over on the left at your activity bar, you can see that you actually have a couple of additional icons that weren't there before. So below the extensions one, down at the bottom, you've got testing and GitHub Copilot Labs. Uh, so let's see here. And actually, I think we might, okay. So account sign in requested, found that little badge. So click there. 
And down the bottom option there says sign in with GitHub to use GitHub Copilot Labs. So click on that. And again, it's recognizing you're already logged in in your web browser to GitHub. So you just have to authorize and say open. The last one you need to install is GitHub Classroom, which isn't automatically popping up here. So where you have GitHub there, hit a space and then start typing class. And there it pops up. So that first hit. So hit install on that one as well. Now click on it. And the same deal. Authorize, hit open. Oh, there we go. And hit open. Okay. Now there's one other step that you may need to do. I think that if you go to your activity bar on the left again. Uh, the third icon down or two up from extensions is it's like three little dots, two circles with lines. It's called source control. So when you mouse over that, you'll see this blue download Git for Windows. And so click on that. Open that. So GitHub is a cloud service and Git is the application that sort of underlies the functionality of GitHub. But you have to install Git separately because Git is an open source software package that's distributed through this website that you're seeing now, whereas GitHub is a private company, so they operate independently of each other. And for Windows, it's quite easy. Uh, right under download for Windows, there's click here to download the latest version of Git for Windows. Uh, right up at the top, right under the word, the heading download for Windows, it says click here to download. So open that up. And again, it'll just be a installer. You want to accept all the defaults. Options. Hit next. There we go. All right, so you can hit finish. Uh, I guess say okay. I'm not sure what it's doing there actually. Oh, I see. Don't get any release notes. You don't need to worry about those. So if you switch back to the VS Code application there, now you're going to have to restart VS Code for it to notice that you installed Git. So just close it with the X in the top right corner and then relaunch it. Right. And this is typically what you'll see when you launch VS Code is the welcome screen. I don't think you'll usually see four tabs all with the welcome screen, but that's okay. VS Code does a good job of onboarding you. And so you can see on the left, it says start, and there's options for creating a new file or opening an existing file, etc. And then on the right, there's walkthroughs. And then there are a couple of pop-ups there that we probably don't have to worry about. I think one, it has to do with Copilot Labs, which won't work until you actually get authorized for Copilot Labs. Those walkthroughs, we won't go through now, but uh, on your own time, those can be useful just to click on those and work through the, the walkthroughs because they'll show you some of the features and get you set up with those different tools. But you'll also learn about them in the course. Let's see. So let's check our Git installation. So over in the activity bar on the left, Again, that source control, that one, click on there. And now it says open folder or clone repository. So that means that Git is installed because before when we went here, it said you have to install Git. Now it's not saying that. So that's telling us Git is installed. So that's good. If you go down to the bottom of the VS Code window on the right, there's three icons. The one on the right looks like a bell, and then there's one beside it, which says tweet feedback. And then the one to the left of that is your copilot icon. And that's how you will 
typically turn on or turn off the copilot assistant because there's times in the course where we ask you to turn it off and focus on writing the code yourself and learning what you're doing. And then other times we'll turn it on and actually get to use it. Saying that there's an error, there's a line through that icon. When you sign up for the GitHub student account, that is what actually gives you access to Copilot because Copilot is typically a, a paid for feature. Uh, so until your student status is verified, that's why it's going to be disabled like that. So yeah, just remember that you will have to like take a photo of your student ID and upload it um, to GitHub in order to get that activated. Now that you've installed Visual Studio Code and the necessary extensions, uh, we're done with Visual Studio Code for now. And if you're taking this course as part of a class, you'll also need to set up GitHub Classroom. Now, to get this set up, this is something that you will do with your instructor because they'll have to add you to the roster for the class. And then they'll send you a link uh, to your first repository. When you click on that link, that'll take you to GitHub. What we're going to do here is assume that magic already happened. Or if you're not enrolled through a class and you want to work through the first lesson getting familiar with GitHub, I'll show you how to do that, even if you don't have a, a student account and you're not part of a GitHub classroom. So if you're not part of a classroom, you can go to github.com slash neural hyphen data hyphen science. And that is the central GitHub home for this course. This is formally on GitHub what's called an organization, which is as it sounds. Um, you can have a personal account, but you can also create organizations that a number of people can be members of and that an organization can host a number of repositories. And so in this case, I've set up an organization for neural data science educational materials. And when you go here, you'll see that there's a number of things that are pinned, like uh, the repository for the textbook and the official website for the course and various workbooks where you can uh, later on in the course as we're working through different chapters you can use these to download the notebooks that you need to actually do the coding yourself and any necessary data files so what we're going to do is scroll down and find the repository that's called github starter course you can see this is a public template so a template repository means that you can click use this template and you'll get a copy of the repository that's kind of your own. Normally, um, when you're working on GitHub, you would clone a repository, and that means you get a copy that's linked back to the main repository on GitHub. So any changes you make and commit would go to that main repository. The template means that you have your own copy that's independent of anybody else, and you can change it at will and not mess up anybody else's work. So you can click Use This Template and say create a new repository and it's going to say the owner is your github username and the repository name it's a good idea just to use the same name so github starter course you can't put spaces in repository names so use hyphens instead it can be public or private um, doesn't really matter you're not going to do anything in here that's really private anyway so this will take a few seconds just to generate your copy of the repository. And now what you're seeing here is kind of the default view when you access any repository on github.com. So at the top, you can see there's the GitHub Octocat logo. There is the name of the owner of the repository you're on, which is my GitHub username. And then the name of the repository you're in, which is GitHub Starter Course. Across the top here, there's a number of tabs, code, issues, pull requests, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. For now, we're just going to focus on the code tab, which is where we are. Next, moving down a bit, see again the name of the repository and where it came from. So it came from the Neural Data Science version of the repository. And below that, you can see the word main. So I mentioned before uh, about branches on GitHub. This is where you could view different branches or create another branch. We're not going to worry about that. Right here is the list of files in your repository. There's only one, it's called readme.md. And that's intentional, we only had one file in this repository so far. An interesting thing about GitHub is that they expect every repository to have a readme.md file. And the purpose of that file is to describe the repository. So when you come to this page, 
that readme gets displayed right here below the list of files and can give you or give anybody who accesses the repository some information on you know what is this who's working on it what's its status maybe there's documentation here links to other things md is uh, for markdown which is talked about elsewhere in the course but basically it's a simple uh, markup language kind of like html but much simpler that allows you to write uh, simple text in a text editor with certain uh, characters that tell it to format the text in different ways. And so, for example, here, the basics of GitHub is a header, first level header, you see emojis there, that's a second level header, the course overview, and then basic text. We'll talk more about Markdown later, but right now the readme.md file, uh, you should read through this because this is this GitHub starter course, the whole content of the course is this readme file talks more about Git and GitHub, understanding the GitHub flow. Some of this we've already covered in the course, but it's important to really get this knowledge deeply sort of embedded in your brain and make sure you understand it. So read this all over. It covers some redundant material, but again, it's presented in a different way. You'll learn it better. And then down at the bottom, it says to complete this assignment. And so there's a few different jobs that you have here, including editing the readme file and committing it. Now, you could actually edit this readme file directly on github.com. That's not the recommended way to do any sort of work with GitHub, but it is an option. And I'm just going to show you that quickly. If I mouse over this pencil icon, click on that. Now it opens this file, this readme file. You can see up at the top, readme. And you're seeing it in the actual markdown. So this hash mark at the beginning indicates that's markdown for first level header. The colon wave colon is the wave emoji, and then the header itself is the basics of GitHub. Two hash marks here indicate a second level header. You could actually type an emoji in directly, and that's the name of our second level header. So I could edit this by saying like, Aaron was here. And then there's no save button. There's a commit changes button, the screen button here. Again, committing is how you commit changes to a GitHub repository. So I'm going to click that and it asks for a commit message. So update readme.md is a pretty generic one. It's good to have commit messages that are a little more specific because again, this is part of the history of your repository that you can look back through and see what was changed. So I can say added my name as the commit message. You can add an extended description if you want because this message can only be a few like 50 characters long. And you have the option of committing directly to the main branch or creating a new branch. We're just going to commit directly to the main branch for now because we're the only ones working on this project anyway. Click Commit Changes. And now you can see in my readme file, Aaron was here. In general, this is not how you want to edit the files, but I did want to show you it's possible. So I clicked back on the Code uh, tab at the top of the screen here. And now what I'm going to do is clone this repository to my computer. Cloning basically means we're going to copy all of the files that are in this GitHub repository from GitHub in the cloud to our personal computer that we're working on right now. So it's this green code button, and you have a few options here. Cloning HTTPS, SSH, GitHub CLI, code spaces. Um, none of these are actually what we want. What we want to do is launch VS Code launched VS Code, and we can clone a Git repository directly from in VS Code. So in your welcome screen, if you're being presented with this welcome screen, there's clone Git repository there. But if not, over on the left, you see our activity bar, which is where there's a series of icons, including the third one down is source control. So that's where you would interact with GitHub. And normally that's where you go to do GitHub stuff in VS Code. So one of my options here is clone repository. I'm going to click that. Then up at the top, it gives me a little pop-up where I could type something or I can say clone from GitHub. And then it's going to, if you haven't already done this, it's going to sign you into GitHub. And that will uh, happen as a separate browser window, which you can't see, but that uh, I'm going to do that. If you're logged into GitHub already, that could just be a button that you click. and useful to say don't ask again for this extension because every time you're going back and forth between GitHub and VS Code, you don't really want to have to hit that open button. And then it asks for a repository name. 
but it, I'm logged in as my GitHub account and it's going to show me all the repositories that I have associated with my GitHub account already, including this GitHub starter course. So that makes it really easy because I can just click on that. And then what it's going to do is uh, ask you where you want to save that on your computer. Now, it's a good idea in your home folder. So my account here is called demo. I would create a new folder in my home folder uh, and I would call it GitHub. I'm going to hit create. One important thing is if you use a cloud service like iCloud or OneDrive or Dropbox, never save your GitHub repositories to a folder that's managed by one of those cloud services because those cloud services will periodically offload files from your computer to the cloud and when you open them again it'll download that file again. That works fine for you know Word documents or other kinds of files but because GitHub is a cloud service itself you don't want some other cloud service messing with the files because what you're going to end up with is weird things happening and it's just not a good situation to be in. So having a GitHub folder in your home folder is a, a good way to avoid that. Say select as repository destination and then it asks would you like to open the cloned repository? Yes. You're also going to get this pop-up every time you open a new repository or a folder on your computer that you haven't opened in VS Code before. It's going to ask if you trust the authors of the files in this folder. In general, you want to say trust, and you can even trust all the files in the parent folder. If you start cloning repositories and projects from people you don't necessarily know, uh, you might be more careful about the trust part. But for the material for this class, uh, you can say, yes, I trust the authors. And that ensures that you have full control over the files and you can run the code in there and that sort of thing. Okay, so once you've cloned that repository, it may not look like anything has changed in Visual Studio Code, but something has, and that's over in the left. It says Explorer, it says GitHub Starter Course, and readme.md. So the Explorer is one of the options you get in your activity bar. It's the top one, the little file icon. So if I click to source control, you can see that goes away. If I click on Explorer, now I see the files in my repository. And these are the files in my local version of the repository. So if I click on the README, now I can see that README file open in VS Code. And you can see the change that I made before, Aaron was here. So for this lesson, we're just gonna make a very simple change in VS Code and then show how we're gonna commit that to our GitHub repository and then push that to GitHub in the cloud. So let's say Aaron was here and he edited this file in VS Code. Okay, so step one, I'm going to go to my file menu and save. It's also Command or Control S. VS Code is pretty good about auto-saving files. Again, that's different from committing or pushing, but you know sometimes you want to manually uh, save the files just to be sure. So now that I've changed that file in my Explorer, you can see something different happened here. Something's changed. The name of the readme file changed to a different color and it says m over on the right that m means it's been modified so vs code is tracking it knows these files are part of a github repository and it's tracking any files that you've modified that haven't been committed and pushed yet so that's kind of handy in terms of tracking your work uh, another thing we can notice is that in the activity bar the third item down source control shows a little one badge here and that means that one file in my repository has been modified and if I click on that, you can see that it highlights the changed file, readme.md, and it's got this button for commit. Don't click that button yet. There's a couple of steps you want to go through. The first is uh, if we had multiple files that had changed, it'll show multiple changes there. And as I said before, you don't necessarily want to commit all your changes at once. So to commit a particular file, you hit the plus beside that file. Now it shows up uh, not under changes, but under staged changes. So stage changes are basically what are going to go into a particular commit. So you can stage individual files separately as separate commits so you can track what was changed file by file much more precisely. And before I hit commit, the other thing is it's going to want a commit message. And so I'm going to say added edit in VS Code. You can be sloppy about uh, capitalization if you want. Now I'm going to click commit. 
All right, so the first time you try and commit something to GitHub, it says make sure you configure your username and user email in Git. This is a bit annoying. It's maybe a little bit confusing. Git is a software tool that existed long before GitHub, but it's kind of the underlying technology that GitHub relies on to do the synchronization between your computer and the cloud. And we installed Git during the install process, but we didn't actually do the initial setup. And if you want to quick learn more, it'll tell you more about how to do that. But I'll walk you through it right now. So instead, I'm going to click on Open Git Log. And what that does is pop up at the bottom of my screen another panel, and it shows what the error is. We've already sort of heard the errors that we're not logged in. And so there's a one-time setup that you need to do, and we're going to do that through the terminal, which means we're going to type things in. And this window that popped up, you can see terminal is one of the other options here. So if we click on terminal, this tells me my username account, what computer I'm running on, and what folder I'm in. And then there's a prompt, and I can type things at that prompt. So we're going to write a command, and the spelling and the spacing is uh, important. So if you get an error, it's probably because you typed something wrong. I'm going to type git, and then config minus minus global and that means that we're gonna yep that means that we're going to change the setting for git across uh, everything on our computer for our account so you won't have to do this uh, again later and then user dot name so like that and then quote marks and set your GitHub username. So this is what you set as your username on GitHub for your GitHub account. So mine was nickel data science. Enter. You don't see any output, but that's done. And then the second thing it wants is what is my GitHub email? And that is going to be a very similar process. So the next thing we need to do is set our email address for Git as well. So here I'm going to say git config, so very similar command, minus minus global. But this time instead of user.name, we're going to say user.email. And then we're going to enter the email that we used to set up our GitHub account. So mine was ncil at dal.ca. Okay, and again, it doesn't show any output, but the command is run. And the way we'll know that the command has run is that when we go back to here and press commit, we don't get that error message. It just changes to sync changes. So again, the workflow in GitHub is you save your file, then you commit with a commit message, and then you push the changes to GitHub, which is the sync changes button here. And every time you click it, uh, it'll pop this up unless you say, OK, don't show again up to you. I'm quite comfortable with this. All it's really reminding you is not only are you pushing any changes, but any changes that were made on the repository remotely will get pulled and synchronized to your computer. So it's doing a two-way synchronization. After you do that the first time, it says, would you like Visual Studio Code to periodically run git fetch? This is in the bottom right. This is fine. You can just say yes. Simplifies your life later on. Okay, and that's done. How do you know it's done? Well, you see nothing in your source control window in terms of modified files. And when I look in my Explorer view, there's no M next to any of my file names. So I know that change has occurred. But it's nice to check that by going to GitHub on the web. So when you switch back to your web browser, you read me file, it says it was modified 17 minutes ago. But if I refresh this page, now it says it was modified one minute ago. So the change that I just pushed to GitHub has been merged and it's on the remote site now. And when I mouse over one minute ago, it shows me in detail exactly when that commit was made. And I can see the change reflected in the README file. Aaron was here and he added the, this file on VS Code. So that pretty much covers what you need to do and what you need to know in order to finish the rest of this lesson. Again, down at the bottom, there's these steps to complete this assignment. The next step is to create another file, a new markdown file in your repository in VS Code, add some information, 
in order to add this information, you might want to refer to this Markdown cheat sheet, and then you're going to push those changes to the GitHub repository as well. And then the other thing is to create a README on your GitHub profile. There's instructions for doing that. So have fun with that. You have all the tools you need at your disposal now to finish that lesson. And from here, our next lessons are going to actually start using Python and learning how to do some coding. So uh, have fun, and we'll see you again there.